All right, we might get started, everyone. Um, so hi all, and welcome to Stock Up, a practical guide to managing internal parasites. It's just ticked over to midday, so we might get a start. Uh, to begin with, I'll just introduce myself. So my name is Patrick MacDonald. I am the project manager for StockSense, and today we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Sandra Baxendell join us to discuss managing internal parasites in goats. Before I hand over to Sandra, I'll just give a brief overview of StockSense and run through some housekeeping. I will note before we begin that we are recording this webinar. So if for any reason you do have to leave early, uh, you will be able to access a recording of the webinar afterwards. So to begin with, I'll just give everyone a brief overview of StockSense. So StockSense is a producer-led extension program, which aims to help producers adopt animal health and product production practices that improve animal welfare and maintain Victoria's biosecurity status. StockSense is funded by the Cattle Compensation Fund and the Sheep and Goat Compensation Fund and is proudly delivered by the VFF Livestock Group. So what does StockSense have to offer you? So StockSense is open to all Victorian livestock owners and will give you access to face-to-face -face events across Victoria, webinars such as the one you're on today, social media channels, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as other resources such as fact sheets and newsletter articles. On top of this, we are also a point of contact for all livestock producers if they have any questions regarding animal health, welfare, or biosecurity. Your feedback is important to us. So feedback from primary producers will really help shape this project and ensure we are targeting what is most relevant to you. This will include some short surveys during and following our events. So to begin with, I might just get everyone who's online to just answer a few short questions for us, which I'll just launch now. So those should be appearing up on your screen. So if you can just take a moment to answer those. So we've just got what part of Victoria are you from? Um, how did you hear about this webinar? And prior to this webinar, had you ever attended a StockSense event? So I'll give everyone just a few moments to answer those questions. Perfect, so we've just got the last few responses coming now. So I'll give everyone five more seconds to finish their answers before I shut that off. So five, four, three, two, one. So I'll end the poll there. Thank you very much. And I can share the results for everyone. So as you should be able to see, we've got a pretty relatively even spread um, across Victoria and a fair few people coming from elsewhere today which is good to see um, in terms of how you heard about this webinar. It's nice to see our social media channels are working. Um, and prior to this webinar, we didn't have many people engage with StockSense. So that sort of says to us that we can um, hopefully improve our um, GOAT offerings moving forward. So I'll stop sharing that. Excellent. And finally, just a bit of housekeeping. So we encourage you to ask questions today and you'll be able to do that using the Q&A function. So you should be able to hover across the bottom of your screen and the Q&A function should be there. Once Sandra finishes her presentation today, we'll go through any questions that have been asked. And we do ask that you keep your questions applicable to everyone on the line today. We won't have time to go through any, specific, uh, any questions specific to your own situation. So finally, and finally, please do ensure that we keep questions and comments respectful for our presenters online. So in finishing, please feel free to reach out. We're always looking forward to engaging with producers on this project, and there are a few ways you can contact us. So you can contact us through email at stocksense at vff.org.au. You can visit our webpage, vff.org.au forward slash stocksense or you can follow us on social media at VFF StockSense on Twitter and Instagram or just StockSense on Facebook. So thank you very much. What I'll do now is I'll hand over to Sandra who will be able to um, proceed with today's webinar. 
So I'll stop sharing that screen now and I'll hand over to yourself, Sandra, and you should be able to start sharing your screen. Okay, welcome everyone. I'll be going rather quickly through it because there's no way I can cover all the things about worms and goats uh, in one hour, but I'll do the most important things. So whenever we consider um, worms uh, or any disease, you have to look at three aspects. The first is the environment, then there's the goats, and then there's the worms. So goats evolved in the Middle East. They evolved in a very dry climate and they put their evolutionary efforts into developing a browsing strategy, which means they didn't get exposed to worms, and also a very large and effective liver that could break down the toxins in the browse plants. Now, sheep and cattle had a different approach to worms. Their evolutionary effort went into developing a gut immune system that allowed them to get, develop an age immunity to worms, but goats really don't have an effective age immunity, which means they can die of worms at any age. Now, an environment like this, which is what you see in commercial dairies, means that the goats are not exposed to worms and therefore don't have a worm problem because they don't have any exposure to pasture. Now, this is what I mean by a feedlot. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that this is a feedlot where goats get a lot of additional feed but there's areas of green grass there and that area of green grass would be massively contaminated with worm larvae. You'd be better off keeping the goats in a smaller area, spraying out that grass so there is no grazing whatsoever. Um, and if you're going to give them the majority of their feed through feeders. Now the feeders must be well designed. The best feeders are fence line feeders where the goats have to put their heads through and they can't put their feet uh, into the food or defecate in it. And you can adapt quite easily. So here's someone that's feeding kids and all they've done is had a, a hot wire that they've strung between these two star pickets to uh, discourage any kids from jumping in and then transferring worm larvae into their feed. Here's another easy uh, hay rack design which prevents contamination by feet or manure. The goats have to turn their head in the, on the side to get in and so they leave their heads in as they're eating a hay so you get a bit of less wastage. You don't use feeders like this. If they can put their feet in, if the kids can jump in, then they're going to transfer worm larvae into their feed. And this is what worm larvae look like. So they swim up the grass in the dew. So if you can keep your pastures as high as possible, and I realize in Victoria, this is quite dif difficult where you have a lot of short rye grass and clover pastures. But if you can keep them high, goats graze from the top down, unlike sheep and cattle. So here is a graph sideways which shows you the distribution of worm larvae on the pasture and you'll see that the vast majority of the worm larvae are below five centimeters. This means that uh, if you can keep it below, um, if you can keep your pastures up to 10 to 15 centimeters high, there's very little uh, worm larvae exposure by the goats as they're grazing. The other thing you can do is to use another species that's a dead end for the worm larvae and the best species is horses. Adult cattle would be suitable um, and what happens is they these animals, the horses eat the worm larvae but they do, don't develop into adult worms and so that the life cycle is not completed. The safest pasture are photocrops and hay stubbles. 
And so you should be keeping these pastures for your wieners uh, and for your kidding does. So we've done the environment, let's consider the goat. So you can use genetics to select goats that are less affected by worms or are more resistant to worms. So if you use Fermatia system and Fermatia cards, you can get tests, select for resilience, but that's only for barber's pole worms. If you use fecal egg counts, you can select for resistance to all worms. Now, the Meat and Livestock Australia did run a bucket evaluation program where they did look at worm uh, resistance in the offspring of, uh, of bucks and that the offspring were all run together. And here are some of the results. So bucks in this um, blue area here, the results range from minus 35 to plus four, sorry, from minus 30 to plus 45. So obviously you don't want the plus 45, which had the highest amount of worm egg counts, but there's huge range there and there's a huge potential for selecting for parasite resistance. So if you're a commercial producer or a stud, I'd strongly encourage you to join Kid Plan and to look at the weaning worm egg counts and the post weaning and the yearling worm egg counts to select for worm resistance. However, we do have to remember the generation intervals. The worms will always win when you look at generation intervals because a homunculus contortus can have a new generation of worms in only 17 days. They produce 10,000 eggs a day and compare that with a goat that you're selecting for uh, worm resistance, they might have uh, two kids by the time they're two years of age. So genetics is going to work in the favor of the worms much quicker than it is for goats. The other thing we can do to make goats more uh, resistant to worms is to ensure that they're well fed and all their nutritional needs are met. So well-fed goats are more able to resist the effects of parasites. So when I'm talking nutrition, you first of all consider energy, then you consider protein, especially bypass protein, and only then do you look at vitamins and minerals. Now there is no vitamin or mineral that will magically make a goat um, less susceptible to worms. As long as their needs are met and they have good nutrition, uh, then they're more resistant to worms. The other thing to remember is that 80-20 rule. So the bottom 20% of your herd, looking at their worm egg counts, these are the worst goats, they're producing 80% of the worms eggs that are contaminating your pasture. So if you can cull those goats out that are always needing drenching, uh, that always have high worm egg counts, and some of my clients' herds, I've been monitoring their worm egg counts for a long time. And even those herds that are run by a wormer, there's still the odd goat in that herd that has high worm egg counts. And it's always the same one or two goats. So if you could cull those goats, the rest of the goats will have much less exposure to worm eggs. The other thing to consider is the periparturient rise. So approximately two weeks before kidding and for the six to eight weeks after kidding, what happens is the worms already in your goats will start producing more and more eggs. Any worms that are hibernating in the gut wall will produce, um, will come out of the hibernation, become adults in the gut and start laying eggs. So does in late pregnancy and early lactation, these are very high egg producers, so should be kept separate from other stock. 
because they're producing large numbers of worm eggs. Goats that have chronic diseases are very susceptible to worms and therefore um, if you can make sure you can keep out caprine arthritis and cephalitis, so that's the white goat there, you can see the swollen knees, and Yoni's disease, um, then you're going to have less worm problems. So this particular goat here with Yoni's disease, the owner just thought she had a very bad case of worms and she did have high worm egg counts, um, but she also had Yoni's disease. So let's now look at worms. So when I first graduated, this is what we were told to do. We were told to drench every single animal in the herd and move them to a new pasture. That just meant that the larva on the pasture in the new paddock only had larva that were resistant to that worm drench. And so those larva became adults, mated with each other, and while this method is excellent for control of worms, it's also excellent for developing drench resistant worms. So now we have a system where we say you don't drench larva on the pasture, you drench larva, uh, sorry, you have um, only drenched those goats that are needing to be drenched because of high worm egg counts or because of clinical signs. So in this case, only um, a few of those worm larvae in the same paddock are the resistant ones and hopefully they will mate with the worms that are susceptible and so you're not increasing the percentage of drench resistance. Now we call the eggs and larva on the pasture and the worms in the untreated goat the refugia. And so you want to keep that refugia full of drench susceptible worms. With targeted selected treatment, you only treat those that need it. So that's the less resilient goats and those that have the most worm eggs. That's the less resistant goats. And it's a balance between a loss of production and prolonging the effectiveness of worm drenches. Now, the most dangerous worm is Homonchus contortus or the barber's pole worms. Now, only some farms in Victoria have this worm, but unfortunately, an increasing number of farms in Victoria have barber's pole worms. So if you don't have barber's pole worms, you must do your utmost to keep it out. So this means if you take your goats to a show, don't let them graze any of the grass around that area of the showgrounds. Don't send your goats out to somebody else for mating. Um, don't uh, allow other goats to come in for mating, except possibly for hand mating where you can allow them to be mated, say, in a driveway uh, so that they don't actually contaminate your pastures. The other main worms of goats are your black scale worms or trichostrongolus. So um, you can't see these worms. You can see barber's pole worms and yabamason, but you can't see your trichostrongolus worms. They're just too tiny. Now the brown stomach worm or Telegodorsagia, which used to be called Ostatagia, you can see them as a moving mass in the abomasum, that's the fourth stomach. And you've also got your Nematodirus worms, which can cause death, loss of condition, uh, slowness of the animals. But the Nematodirus worms have very large eggs, so you can actually identify it from a worm egg count. Now this is what the mouth of a barber's pole worm looks like and you'll notice this little lancet at the top of the worm's head, top of the mouth. Now that uh, punches a hole into the little capillary which is the smallest blood vessel and then the uh, worm actually laps up the blood 
and they can uh, each female worm can drink 0.05 of a mil of blood a day and so you can have large numbers of worms and that um, can kill a goat from blood loss prior to that goat losing any body condition so this is the fourth stomach and this is opened up and sometimes when a goat's died of worms you actually don't see the barber's pole worms. And that's because just before the goat dies, the worms jump ship. And so they release and uh, they hope to get passed out in the feces before the goat dies. But you can see the little pinpoint blood spots where they were feeding. So this is the life cycle of uh, goat worms. You've got the goats in the gut, eggs come out with the feces. Um, the eggs hatch in the fecal pellets, then the larvae burrow their way out. These larvae go through some molts until they reach their third stage molt, and then they wait on the grass for a, another goat to come along and eat them. So with the homonchus contortus, a barber's pole, they hatch in only four to six days. It's only three to four days in summer. The best larval development is in humid weather. We've had a lot of rain this year, so it's a bad worm year. And when the temperature reaches a daily maximum above 27.8. Now the larvae can stay on pasture for months. They die because they can't feed. So they can only last about 35 days if it's hot, because if it's hot, they have a lot of movement. But in cool weather, they can last for four to six months. So the average is about 60 days for a pasture to become safe, but bear in mind the temperature. The life cycle of Homonchus contortus is only between 14, which would be extreme, to 21 days. The other worms have a slightly longer life cycle, um, but it's, a, it's about the same. The other thing we've noticed is with climate change that Homonchus contortus is actually um, uh, changing. So it's no longer going into hibernation in winter. It continues to lay eggs all throughout winter. Whereas previously it used to go into hibernation in the gut wall. So it is changing and also the distribution of homunculus contortus is changing. So the top black and white graph there was the distribution in 1936 and the coloured graph is the distribution in 2016 and you'll see in Victoria here that there's been a massive increase in the uh, areas that are affected with um, Barber's pole worm. So the clinical sign of Barber's pole worm is bottle jaw, and that's due to low protein. And what happens as well as losing blood, the goat's losing protein in its uh, abomasum. And this causes fluid to accumulate underneath the jaw. Now bottle jaw can also be caused by liver fluke and Yoni's disease. Um, so bear that in mind. Bottle door is always associated with a severe anemia. And uh, in this case here, you can see this poor goat's almost white. So you don't want to wait. If you see bottle jaw, you've got to drench immediately because a large number of these animals will actually die. You can give an individual goat uh, a blood transfusion and then it's got more hope. But uh, once they reach this stage, uh, it's very serious. You can use Fermatia scoring. So this is a, a card system developed in South Africa and it rates them from uh, red to white. Unfortunately, condition scoring and Fermatia scoring go in opposite directions, but it's easy to remember because five is fat for condition scoring. And you can see the large amount of fats 
that's uh, underneath the tail of this goat. And five, which is this white, is fatal in goats. So these are from Archer scores. And um, so you need to be able to use your system to get both condition scores on your goats and a score for their anemia. Also, you can just look at them. The, if they've got a rough coat, they, they appear skinny, then high probability that this is due to worms. Now you can do a, a histogram of your goats, either from, from March up or condition score. And remember five is being fatal. So you always drench fours and five on the Famarcha system and 1.5, uh, they're nice and pink. You rarely get a one, which is red in goats. You do get them in sheep. So this is your targeted selective treatment. So when I say you don't drench all the goats in your goat herd, you trench those that need it. And this is how you determine if they need it. You look at their eye mucous membrane color and you look at their FMARCHA score, you put your hands along their back, just behind the last rib, and you get the condition score. You have a look under the tail for any scouring. Ideally, you do fecal egg counts. You have a look at the coat. Is the coat nice and shiny? Is it got a gloss on it? And again, you have a look underneath the jaw for any swelling, remembering that if it's got a bottle jaw, then that's very serious. You've already uh, done a lot of damage and uh, that goat is in danger of dying. Now you do have to finesse targeted selective treatment. So for does in late pregnancy and early lactation, you treat if only one of these things is present. So you always treat for Marcher scores four and five. So that's very pale pink to white. If they've got three kids, either on ultrasound or they're trying to raise triplets, then you would drench them. If their body condition score is only one or a two, if they're a first kidder, bearing in mind that younger animals are susceptible to worms, then you drench them. And kids and coat, goatlings, if they're not meeting their weight gains that you want, and they're for March of three, four or five, for March of three is borderline, then you would drench those. And with your worm egg counts, what you need to do is have a look at the drench decision guides. These are on the Worm Boss website. So it's only one page and you can either use the decision tree where you answer questions, put in your worm egg count and it will tell you what the worm egg count is. Now the one for Victoria, is done for Victorian properties that do not have barber's pole worms. So if your property does have barber's pole worms, then this will need to have some adjustment. So you need to talk to your vet about that because remember that your barber's pole worm are putting out 10,000 eggs per day. So you can get very, very high numbers of worm eggs. Whereas your other worms, your Telidorsagia, your Trichus chonglis, they're producing very few worm eggs. And so some of these cutoff points in these decision guides are only 200 eggs per gram, which in Queensland um, would be nothing. <laughs> so this is where you find your drench decision guide for your area. So in Victoria is there in blue. So that's on the Worm Boss website. And you can either open the complete program, read all about worm control, so I strongly recommend that, or go direct to the drench decision guide and answer the questions. So the basics of drenching are, you must check your drench gun. So if you've got a drench gun attached to a backpack, you must uh, put that first drench into a disposable syringe and check what you have dialed on your drench gun is what came out. So you must have a good drench gun that's accurate. You must be able to weigh your goats. If you don't have scales, uh, you can use the heart girth chart, which is on my website, www.goatvetoz.com.au backslash worms. 
which converts centimetres to kilograms. Uh, you must drench over the back of the tongue. So don't use a 20 mil syringe to try and drench your goats. Goats will just spit it out. You've got to use a uh, dredge gun. And ideally you'd use a combination of antimitics from several different classes of actives. Now, when I say a combination, you either buy a combination drench that's prepared for sheep, get your veterinarian to um, prescribe that for you, or you go up the drench race with one drench, and then you go back down the drench race with another drench from a different family. You don't mix them together. So the general recommendations, you must know what worms in your herd. Do you have barber's pole worm or not? Are your worms resistant to one of the classes of worm drenches? You need to know that. And you only treat those animals that need it based on targeted selective treatment. And also the condition of the animal and the stage of lactation it is in, its age, etc. So this is when you do a worm egg count, this is what you see. You can't identify Homonchus contortus or Trichostrongulus or um, Caladosagia, but you can identify Nematodirus. So here's a Strongyle worm egg, and you can, this is a Nematodirus egg, and you can see the massive difference in size. So they say that you should do a drench resistant test every two to three years and, and sheep properties that's easily done. You do uh, get a mob of wieners, you divide it into groups of 20, 120 is control, 120 is for white drenches, one group of 20 is for uh, clear drenches, one group of 20 is maybe for some other types. But very few goat herds have that large numbers of wieners. But you don't need that number if you use individually identified goats. And so each goat becomes its own control. So you drench, you get a worm egg count before for that individual goat, drench them, and then do a worm egg count 14 days later. Now, when I first graduated, we were told to rotate your drench family every year. That didn't really work. It worked well for controlling worms, but we got drench resistance. So then we went to five year rotations and that didn't work very well either. Then we were told to use a worm drench until such time as that no longer worked, then switch to a different drench family. Now we know that the best method is to use two or three actives in the one drench so that the worms have got to get resistance genes for two to three drenches at the same time in order to survive. So these are the drench families. You've got the white drenches or benzimidazoles. Then you've got the clear drenches such as levamazole or oroject. Then you've got the mectins. So this is cydectin, diromectin, ivermectins. Then the new drench, monopantal or solvex and startec. Plus the combination drenches, which are only registered for sheep, but can be um, prescribed for goats by your veterinarian. Then there are the narrow drenches, such as ramatin, which is an organophosphate, which is a little bit too toxic, I think, to use on goats, and closantal, which is one of the actives in Q-Drench, which only works on barber's pole worms. Then you have the narrow drenches for treating liver fluke and tapeworms. The most important thing is how you look after your worm drenches. Unfortunately, a lot of times when I go on a goat property, I ask to see their worm drenches and they're in a garden shed, a tin garden shed in the Queensland summer. There is a label, that label has instructions of how it needs to be stored. 
And QDrench, for example, says it must be stored below 30 degrees C. And so that means an air conditioned room in summer. It says it can't be refrigerated. So you have to keep it inside in air conditioning. We store our drenches with a temperature alarm. We store them in a cupboard in a cellar. Uh, but if it does get above 30 degrees, then we get an alarm in the house and we know to go and put it in an air-conditioned room. Also, QDrench says uh, you must shake the full use. And so here's a picture of QDrench in a glass jar. And you can see that it has separated out. So when it says shake, you must vigorously shake the full use. The other warning I'd like to give is that don't use the names, brand names of drenches. So for example, if you use Zoldex Bus, QDrench and StarTech, thinking that you're going to have a good quarantine drench for new animals coming on your property, you're actually giving abamectin three times. So you have to be aware of toxicity. Unfortunately, if you've got dairy goats, most of the labels on the sheep's drenches state, do not use on animals whose milk is used for human consumption. Now, New Zealand and the UK have default with holding periods for milk. But unfortunately, a vet's prescription cannot override a do not use statement. I've written many submissions to government reviews on lack of access to worm drenches for goats. Um, and they're all on my website. Don't use porons for goats. They're not registered for goats. They're only registered for cattle. But more importantly, it's been shown that they do not work. And the other thing that's been shown is that in Switzerland, when uh, epimetrin porons were available, they did a survey uh, a few years later and they found 100% of farms that they tested had resistance to the mectins. So you can go to the Australian Pesticide Veterinary Medicines Authority website, look in PubCris, put in the name of the worm and goats, and you'll get those drenches that are registered for goats. So this is one I did uh, last month, and that looks a reasonable list. However, all the ones in light brown are this, virtually the same drug. So they're virtually the same as Panicure. The blue ones are Abamectin, Capramex no longer made. Verbamec is uh, still available in some shops, uh, online stores, but it's going to no longer be registered for goats. And the Orogec, which is a little uh, capsule, uh, is registered for goats, but it's not registered for milking goats. So soon, for dairy goats, the only thing left will be panicure, and there's a lot of resistance to white trenches. The other thing to remember is that the label dose on these are too low. So you need a veterinary as a bite note or a prescription. And according to the textbooks, it needs to be double for white trenches. So things like panicure, it's double. And for the others, it's 1.5 times the sheep dose remembering that goats have that very efficient liver that breaks down drugs more rapidly. So in Victoria, you can use sheep drenches for goats legally, but you can only use them at the sheep dose rate, which is too little. So everyone needs a veterinary advice note or a vet's prescription if using sheep worm drenches. Remember that livestock production assurance We'll audit them, so you need to save those and you have to save them for two years, the same as your vet has to save them for two years. And this is what a veterinary advice note in Victoria looks like. So it has to be filled in with the vet's details, all your details um, and how you're going to administer that. And the vet has to give a withholding period. So, <clears throat> the first time you buy a bottle of drench, you should do a drench check. So this is doing worm egg counts of individual goats 
before and after drenching. Must be 14 days after drenching. If it's too early, sometimes the worms are just a bit sick and don't lay eggs, but you can't wait any later than 14 days because if they went out of the um, immediately after you drenched them, they went out and ate some grass or worm larvae. Just after 14 days, those worm larvae will be adults and laying eggs. Now you can find a list of um, vets or labs that do worm egg counts on the worm bus website underneath your state. So the newest drenches, StarTech and Zolvex, have meat withholding periods, but no milk withholding periods. Zolvex, which is very safe and very good, um, has a meat withholding period, uh, export slaughter interval, sorry, for uh, goat sheep that would be export meat, and that's 10 weeks, which is quite long. So a vet, when setting the withholding periods, needs to balance out the higher dose rate you're giving. If a, a worm drench is not registered for goats, then it has to be below the level of reporting, which can be parts per million or even lower. And that's balanced against the goat's fast metabolism of veterinary drugs. So for the Australian drenches, which are registered for goats, the, this is the meat and milk withholding periods. And Oxfendibazole has a meat withholding period, the same as oral jet. However, in America, they don't have the wider range of drenches that we have, but they do have meat and milk withholding periods. Now, this chart was only recently updated and the milk withholding days was increased for most. So this is where vets would get their advice as to what withholding periods uh, they would use. So let's come now to something that's different from a drench, and this is your copper oxide wire particle boluses. Now they only work against homonchus or barber's pole. They give about a 21 day protection, but you can only give them four times a year, otherwise you risk top copper toxicity. If you've only got a small number of goats, you don't need to, to buy a balling gun. Uh, you can just open the capsules, sprinkle it on a slice of margarine bread and um, feed it to them or put it in a bit of molasses. The dose is one to two grams for an adult goat or if you've got miniatures or kids, 0.5 to one gram. But the good news is that a copper oxide wire particle bolus if given with drenched white trenches, even if that white trench is only 60% effective, it'll increase its effectiveness up to 95%. So there are a lot of brand names that are registered for goats. So last month, this is how I, what I found. So these are all the brand names. Now they're registered for goats, but they're only registered for goats for treating copper deficiency. So if you're using them more than once a year, then you're going to need a veterinary advice note or a vet's prescription. So they work on barber's pole worms. They work if you are developing drench resistance, but you do need to monitor copper levels. This is what happens when you have a range of trace minerals. So if you don't have enough, the animals are ill, then you have a range where you get maximum productivity and then it goes the other way again when you develop in toxicity. Except copper is different and you'll notice that sharp drop off. And this is because copper is stored in the liver and you get some more copper and the goat's liver stores some more copper, stores some more copper and it then says it's like the store that broke the camel's back. It says, I cannot store any more copper in my liver and it releases all the copper. And so the liver becomes pale and friable. The urine, the um, copper is released into the bloodstream. It just starts destroying the red blood cells. They're filtered out by the kidneys. So the kidneys become this blue gun metal color. The urine becomes dark from the destroyed red blood cells. But 
generally most people wouldn't notice. They'd say, oh, goat suddenly dropped dead, snake bite. So unless you look, you don't know if you've got copper toxicity. Now, bioworma is was waited for with bated breath, was developed by the CSIRO, and then uh, finally commercialised. So it's basically fungal spores, which are fed daily. Those fungal spores hatch out within the manure, and those fungus lasso and eat the worm larvae in the manure. There is no milk withholding period and no meat withholding period. Unfortunately, bioworma is very expensive, and currently there is no bioworma available. The manufacturers are having uh, problems making it. So there is none available. Hopefully soon, though I have had it on back order since July. But due to the expense, you need to consider using it strategically. And one of the most important things you can do is to feed it to animals while they're in quarantine. So when you get new animals in, you give them drenches from as many drench families as legal. But if any of those worms survive and start producing eggs and larva, you know that they are resistant to all the worm drenches you can legally use on your goats. Therefore, you need to feed them by a wormer so that those worm larvae don't contaminate your pastures and pass that drench resistant on to your other goats. A lot of my clients who have only very small numbers of goats, they're in small yards or they're fed daily. They can't rotate um, their yards or they manage their pasture. They don't have horses. So bioworm has been really helpful for them. And it also works on drench resistant worms. And some of my clients have only got one drench family left that works for them. But you consider using it during the periparturian rise period. So if you can't separate your pregnant goats from other goats, if you feed your pregnant goats um, bioworma, then you're going to stop that rise in egg uh, production and larval production that's contaminating your pastures. So that's when you could use it, even though it is expensive. Now, Barber's Fax is another uh, option, only for Barber's pole worm. Again, no milk withholding period. You need two priming doses and then you have to vaccinate every six weeks. So it's not an easy option. The other thing is there were tr three trials done. So the green trial there at Gaira, they got excellent results, um, real difference and much lower worm egg counts. But the Dorigo site, so-so, mm, and the Chiswick site, there's really no difference. Uh, between the control group and the vaccinated group. We don't know why, um, but registration was not progressed. But you can use it with a vet's prescription um, if you do have problems. So this is my final slide. You need to consider the R's. So you need the right product, right animals, right time, the right dose rate, administered in the right way, and I added in combined with the right pasture management. So I'll stop the slide share there and uh, I'll open it up to questions. Perfect. So thank you very much for that, Sandra. It was a very, um, very worthwhile presentation and there was a lot of very useful information in there. Um, so we'll get through to the questions in just a second, but just for everyone still online, um, while you can, I'll just get you to um, fill out a few post-webinar questions, which I'll launch. So you'll just have between now and the end of the um, webinar just to complete those. So those should pop up right now. Um, and if you do have any questions, again, feel free to um, use the Q&A function to type those. 
Um, so we've got two questions here from Kayleen Baird so far. Um, so the first one is, can you mitigate pasture worm load by grazing horses or cattle to reduce the 60 day period? Uh, certainly, yes. Um, I would wait seven days before you add them. That allows all the worm eggs to hatch. Uh, then put them in, graze it right down, then uh, take them out, let that pasture get up as high as possible, ideally above five centimetres, then the goats can go back in. Perfect. And the second question we've got here is just in regardless of WEC on arrival, um, would you suggest all new animals introduced to your property be drenched? Yes. And with at least um, two, to, two to three actives, bearing in mind what's legal to use and not. Just remember that some worm drenches, as they're developing resistance, uh, it makes the worms feel sick and so they stop laying eggs. So they still could be in the gut. All right, so I'll mark that one as answered. If there are any other questions um, that anyone would like to ask, feel free to do so now. Um, so we've just had two pop up. So can you use Decamax for dairy goats? No. <laughs> nice, quick answer to that one. Um, and then another one is how can we access the, I believe that's Femacar, Femarcha oh, cards. cards. Sorry. So the Femarcha cards, are, there's an agreement with the copyright owners in um, South Africa. So every country has an agreement and the agreement was, is with the Australian New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists, small ruminant chapters. And the answer is you contact me because I'm the current president. So what we'll do is at the end of the um, webinar, we'll send out a, uh, an email um, and we'll have the contact details for Sandra. So a link to her website as well in there. Um, and I've just seen a question come through about where the recording of this will be. So we'll pop that up on our YouTube page, but we'll also be emailing that out to everyone who's registered for the webinar. I should um, also just mention that for the Famarcha cards, the agreement states that people must have done a worm course and must pass an examination, including a practical examination on how to use the cards. But I um, can do that by Zoom and uh, video. Excellent. Um, so we've just got a few more questions that have come through. So how long before kidding should buy a worm are they fed to doze? Uh, at least two weeks. Um, and with regard to COWP, do you think the blood test used to look at CU levels in individual goats is accurate? It's not as good as liver biopsies, um, but it's uh, much better because, you know, liver biopsies have some risks in live animals. Um, but if you're slaughtering a goat for meat for your own consumption, then I'd encourage you just to freeze a sample of liver and then when you've got enough frozen, you can get those tested. Excellent. Um, and the next question is, do you suggest we do a strategic summer drench? How does that work? Yes. So this is um, in those areas like um, Victoria with the Mediterranean climate, people are moving away from the strategic um, summer drench. Certainly you could consider using a one summer drench but maybe not the second and it depends it's a balance as I said between a loss of production um, and developing drench resistance so from a production point of view the summer drench is very very important for just minimizing next year's worm burden but you have to balance that out excellent um, and the next question we've got is, what would be a high protein level of feed for a milker producing five kilograms of milk per day? So um, you need at least an 18% crude protein in the grain supplement. It depends also on what um, hay or pasture you've got and the protein levels in that. And it's just a matter of sitting down with the nutrient requirement book and tables and working it out 
with um, milk alkylator. So, but in early lactation, generally protein isn't, they can't eat enough to get enough protein. Um, and the next question we've got here, um, is there a safe way to start goats grazing in a completely clean paddock? Has, had, has not had livestock in it for years with the eye on them dropping resistant eggs? No, unless you're feeding by a wormer, which would be the only, only option, um, not currently available. Okay. Uh, we talk about goat resistance to worms, but when measuring egg counts, some goats are much bigger eaters than others, so they will have higher loads because of this. Um, yes. <laughs> so theoretically, they, they will get it. Um, but I don't think that makes a difference. You still, uh, if you're doing selection, you should uh, select for your worm egg count before they become milkers or before they're lactating. So with the kid plan, you're uh, doing worm egg counts on all the wieners or all the goatlings, and you're selecting those that have the lower count then. You don't do it in your adult um, goats raising kids. Um, so the next question, can you decant worm and meds in large bottles into smaller bottles for ease of usage or will this affect usage? Uh, so long as it's well shaken up beforehand um, and bear in mind that some of the newer drenches like Zolvex and StarTech can eat through some plastics. So, um, you know, you have to be very careful. Glass is safe, but then you run the risk of dropping it and breaking it. And one final question. So some vets don't know how to proceed with getting worm types processed. Are there a, are there a variety of pathology services that can do these tests? Yes, there, there are. And they're all listed on um, uh, the Worm Boss website. So Worm Boss every year or so do a quality assurance program. And uh, the quality assurance, they post out fecal egg counts and only those um, labs that got the correct answer for the number of worm eggs are listed on the Worm Boss website. And if you're choosing a lab, you should choose from that list or from a NATA accredited laboratory. Excellent. So we've just had two more questions pop through. So I'll get Sandra to answer these and then we'll have to shut off the um, Q&A section because we're almost at time, but it is really great to see heaps of questions coming through. Um, so what about fibre producing goats, e.g. angoras, do you recommend the same regimen, regime? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, and paying very particular attention to protein because the mohair that they produce uh, does cause a protein chain. Perfect. And the last question, so using combo drenches, why is this better than using individual drenches? And interactions. We don't do this for human antibiotics. So why, why for drenches? Um, because of the mutations that are needed to get the uh, resistance. So if a, uh, and unfortunately they, they actually got, they had some worms that were actually put into liquid nitrogen uh, prior to dibenzol being released. That's the first modern worm. And they actually looked at them and they found a percentage of those worms who'd never been exposed to a worm drench actually had resistance. And so we know that there are naturally out there mutations that make worms less susceptible to worm drenches. But the probability of them being less susceptible to two or three worm drenches at once is quite low. And that's why the combinations are used. Uh, and actually, we do use combination antibiotics um, quite regularly. So <laughs> that's not, a, not a, a valid reason. Perfect. And just finally, we've just had a comment come through from Kayleen Baird, so the chair of the VFF Goat Industry Advisory Group. Um, so she'd 
would just like to thank you for your time today on behalf of the VFF Goat Industry Advisory Group. Um, and she would also just to like to let everyone know that the Goat Industry Advisory Group welcomes VFF membership and industry inquiries, um, which you can access by emailing or calling the VFF. Um, and somebody else has just said, you know, someone really knows their stuff when they can answer random questions immediately with no notice. And I must agree with that, Sandra, you've done an excellent job. So thank you very much. And on behalf of the VFF Stock Sense team, I would very much like to thank you for your time today, as well as for everyone else who hopped on the line today. Uh, it was great to see such fantastic engagement from everyone. Um, and as I said, we will email out a recording to everybody who's registered uh, with a bit more information as well, if you would like. Uh, other than that, we will finish the webinar now and I hope to see everybody out face to face at some time in the near future. So thank you very much for hopping online today. Excellent, so we'll just finish the webinar there.